first. Yep, done. Started. Okay. Okay. Hello and welcome to Decoding the Gurus, the podcast where two academics listen to content from gurus across the online world and we try to understand what they're talking about. And in this special uh, interview slash chatette episode, we have someone here to help us some understand some of the reasons why gurus are so appealing. So welcome, uh, T. Nguyen. Hello, hello. Okay, so T is a professor in philosophy at the University of Utah. And um, uh, he's done some very interesting work on how the online infosphere affects people's thinking, um, including the phenomenon of outrage porn, which he can tell us about, um, as well as epistemic bubbles and echo chambers and other interesting things. So it's great to have you on, T. Thank you very much. So to get us rolling, um, we might start off with um, uh, briefly with your stuff on outrage porn because on on DTG where we're really interested in essentially fake things masquerading as the real thing well right? stated Matt really well <laughs> explained <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I bet. so um so yeah um so outrage porn is kind of a similar thing so maybe tell us a quick bit about that Okay, so this paper, I <laughs> wrote this paper, um, and uh, I will be honest, the paper started as a drunk Facebook conversation on someone else's thread between me and Becca Williams, who turned into my co-author for this. And I was just like, it was like two in the morning. I was like, you know what? No one's given a good definition of <laughs> food porn, because we talk about it all the time, and philosophers like to define stuff. And of course, there's like this this huge amount of work on like sexual pornography but there's this new use right and i think we all know it food porn poverty porn ruin porn like closet porn my wife says to calm herself down she goes to look at this site called things organized neatly which is just obviously organization porn um, i'm adding it to my bookmarks <laughs> um, yeah. it's it's you it's it is it is it is strangely sexual. And one of the things you can see is when you look at these porn sites, like food porn and organization porn, it's obviously porn-like. So we were trying to figure out what it was. And Becca had this incredible suggestion. There's this old paper from Michael Ray, where he says, what sexual pornography is, is you take, you exchange sexual images outside of the context of a relationship for not not for furthering a relationship. He was really interested in the fact that, you know, people could exchange, you know, naked and erotic pictures as part of a healthy relationship, but porn was something else. So he thought it was like this, this weird thing that existed outside of the normal goals of like intimacy and connection and a romantic relationship. And we were like, hell yeah, we can generalize that definition. Yeah. So here's our definition of porn. X porn for any X, because I am a philosopher. I'm... <laughs> X porn. X porn is um, representations of X used for immediate gratification while avoiding the costs and consequences of entanglements with the real thing. So, food porn, pictures of food make you feel all hungry and good and whatever, salivating, but without having to buy food or make it or deal with the nutritional consequences or go out like yeah. real estate porn cool pictures of real estate without having to buy for it or care for it and one of the suggestions we made was okay here's a new kind you can identify moral outrage porn right mm -hmm. moral outrage porn is representations of morally outrageous situations engaged in for instant gratification for the pleasure of moral outrage mm -hmm. rather than for actual moral action and i want to be super clear here a lot of people read the stuff of ours and they immediately try to adapt it to this like crappy end that i don't believe in at all the crappy end is oh this means moral outrage is bad let's all be civil and nice to each other fuck that that's not what we meant what we meant was right when you say that if you think that sexual pornography is bad you don't think sex is bad we don't think that moral outrage is bad. Like moral outrage is incredibly important. It's motivating, aimed at the real thing, <laughs> aimed at actual morally problematic situations. It's one of the most crucial emotions we have. It's because real outrage, moral outrage is so important that the pornified version, which simplifies moral outrage for the sake of pleasure is so devastating. 
And one of the worries is, as with all other kinds of porn, shorn from the responsibilities of doing it in a nuanced and careful way, um, when you're just like optimizing it for pleasure. So, I mean, if you, if you want to be really moral, you have to pay attention to nuance, you have to pay attention to people's feelings. But if you're just in it for the pleasure of outrage, then you want to do something else. Something else. You want to tune it for max pleasure. And tuning it for max pleasure involves like making it simple, making it easy to access, making it unnuanced, making it uncomplicated, right? Making it into like moral candy. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that seems like very much an idea for the modern age where like so, so much of people's lives is conducted online and it, it, in this virtual, not unreal kind of sense and is often yeah. performative to some degree. Yeah. Um, so when I heard about um, the, the, this idea, I immediately thought of so many instances of, um, let's see, moral grandstanding, yeah. uh, which is a t um, public shaming and, and, and that kind of online activism, which becomes a kind of slacktivism. Where I, where I suspect, I think, so I'm, I'm extending from your idea here, I know, not, yep. it's not exactly what you were talking about, but it feels like those are also things that can sometimes be a facsimile of the real thing, which is quite time consuming and difficult and frustrating, right. um, uh, but, but are done just really for the pleasure of it. Right. I mean, there, you might think there's a, there's a slight difference. So moral grandstanding is like, using expressions, expressions of morality for status and moral porn is using expressions of morality for pleasure. So they have slightly different purposes, but they share a similar structure, which is you're not supposed to use morality for pleasure or status, right? Yeah. You're supposed to use it to be good. Um, <laughs> yeah. And so any of those are perversions. Um, I mean, in a, in, a, in a real sense of perversion, Thomas Nagel has this great account of what perversion is. He says like perversion is like looking at something uh, which, has, which has a real function and then taking it away from that function. And he, he was talking about all, and I think like, I mean, this is, this is what I think is happening with many expressions of morality. And I, I, I'm a, I wish I could go back in time and change one thing. A lot of people read this stuff and they immediately are like, oh, this only applies to expressions of outrage. I have expressions of civility and calm and connection. That shit is just as pornifiable, right? Mm -hmm. If you mm -hmm. express centrist expressions of like, let's all get together, let's be civil and kind to each other, enough with this moral outrage, and you do it to feel smug mm -hmm. or... <laughs> Yeah, say the radical left. Yeah, it's it's just as pornified. Yeah, I I I know this that whenever this concept came up and people were debating it online, that they they kept conflating the point that when they hear you say that, they think you're saying civility doesn't matter. Civility is important. Like we don't need to be nice to people, but they and they avoid the fact that the qualifier porn is there. Right, that's the whole point. That you're right. not denigrating civility and being respectful to people you're denigrating the kind of indulgence of a, a, a kind of outside of its purpose and well, it, well i'd say the when, when it's done in a performative way chris I'm right sure, you know we, we both know of instances of of how it's done in a very elaborate kind of way where um you know so you know it's a it's a way of showing oh look how much credit i'm giving look how open-minded i'm being look how yeah yeah and that, there's I, I, Oh, go ahead. Uh, I think you want to distinguish between the performative and the hedonistic, right? And mm -hmm. I think they may go together. So I think the moral grandstanding stuff may be more performative. You're doing it more to look like you're moral than to actually be moral. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And the hedonistic is you're engaging it for your own pleasure. Yeah. And I think often my suspicion is a lot of the output putters of moral outrage porn would be described as performative and a lot of the receivers of the audience and the audience are engaged in it for hedonistic reasons and these yes. may be parasitic with the i mean maybe symbiotic with each other yeah that makes a lot of sense to me i think um yeah fascinating I mean, would you, so tai one thing that came up when you were describing that is the the concept of a kind the super stimulus Right, that right. in the modern environment we have things that activate our our moral senses or or our desires, but they're 
the kind of super attractors for it. And, you know, there's lots of examples from evolutionary biology that's applying to like other animals. Um, and I, so I was wondering, is there an, an is that inherent to it that the, yeah. the, for something to be porn, that there's a super stimulus aspect of it, or is that not necessarily, does that not need to be there for the concept? Oh, P.S. My name is pronounced T, not T. T. Sorry. Yeah. yeah. No problem. <laughs> no problem. Um, so uh, I don't think it's necessary, but it's a common result of a certain functional relationship. So you can use anything as porn, right? Like this is this is re so Michael Ray made this re point. Like people can exchange intimate sexual pictures for as part of the relationship. And then someone else grabs it and uses it as porn, right? And I think the same thing is true of, um, of moral outrage porn, which is, I mean, I could act, it's com the situation is really complicated. Like you might think that someone could sincerely tweet a genuine expression of moral outrage from a really morally difficult situation and other people could use or retweet it for porn, mm. right? Yeah. Um, and so, so, but the thing that I'm really worried about it is if you, so when you use something for porn, you're trying to use it for pleasure. So if people start consciously producing it, then they'll want to optimize the pleasurable aspect. So I keep, in everything I, I've been talking about, I keep running this, um, this background analogy with like the industrial production of sugary and salty snacks, right? Like, so there's a, we're evolved to want sugar and salt for fine reason. Like in the environment of evolutionary adaptedness, they were moderately correlated with nutrition. And so we get pleasure from those things. And the moment someone can profit off of mm. giving us pleasure, then they're not gonna target the original function, right? They're not gonna target nutrition. They're gonna target the thing that gives us pleasure. So if there's any wiggle room, Right. Mm. You, I mean, you should expect companies that make money off of selling food to exaggerate the super stimulus part that gives us pleasure. Right. Because that, and I, I suspect the same thing. Right. If you're peddling moral outrage porn, uh, and especially if that gives you power, then you're going to, ex and you're, you're, you have uh, audience people who have started to get used to and want and crave pleasurable moral stimulation. Then you'll have reason to exaggerate whatever parts of it are pleasurable, like mm. the, whatever will give people the sensations of confidence or smugness or any of that. Mm. Now, the, um, the the point where your um, work really um, became super interesting and relevant for me was when you moved into looking at the the sort of stuff you cover in your manuscript, the seductions of of clarity. Yeah, which, which I think is a you know correct me if I'm wrong, but it seems like a, like a cognitive parallel to to the to to to, to the outrage porn in in that it's um, well I'll, I'll let you describe it, but in in, in my fuzzy understanding, it, it seems to be that you're you're talking about how actors can can focus on giving the feeling an impression of yeah. of insight and that aha kind of feeling, but actually is really can be a substitute for the real thing. So. No, exactly right. So, I mean, you all should help me because I shoveled a bunch of papers at you and you're at, for people in the audience, these, these two did this enormously like insane thing of reading this whole pile of my papers for no reason. Uh, uh, and they're all related to each other in ways that are really hard for me to say. And I'm actually currently trying to write a book for not just academics but for everyone about it and i'm having a little bit of trouble saying what that center is i can say it in technical philo philosophical language i'll do that later it's gross but, so, <laughs> yeah. but no this is exactly right so this is there's a separation between the signal and the actual content so here's the idea of the sections of clarity right so clarity so i mean something specific by clarity i mean the feeling we get right so um alison gopnik uh a psychologist who studies this stuff has this paper called, I think it's called Understanding as, as Orgasm. And it's this moment of like, she's trying to talk about that cognitive moment of like epiphany, like, aha, like I get it. And everything falls into place and it feels good, right? Mm. So 
What I was thinking, what I'm thinking is, look, we're limited beings. We can't do everything. We need to know what to pay attention to and what not to pay attention to. And so my, my claim, which I, I have some integration with the psychology, you can tell me if the integration was good, but I think I have some uh, backing from the cognitive sciences and psychology. My claim is that we use the feeling of clarity, the sensation of understanding as a guide to when to stop thinking. When you get that aha moment, right? That, uh, mm, that feels like, that feels right. Then you're like, oh, I, I get it. So you stop thinking about it and you start thinking about something else, right? Yeah. So we use the feeling of understanding as a heuristic for terminating inquiries. So mm -hmm. if that's true, then it would be really valuable for anybody who wanted to manipulate our beliefs to game that feeling. So if you could fake the feeling of understanding, right? Then you could get control of people's attention, what they paid attention to, right? You can, I think in the paper, I have this analogy of like, look, a magician, so stage magicians, actually what they train in is to make the hand that's actually doing the work look boring and the hand that's not doing the work really interesting to send people's attention away. Like it's a, to, a signal of boringness is an invisibility cloak. Uh, mm -hmm. And so if you can manipulate people's feeling that they understand, then you can cloak things behind a similar like cognitive invisibility cloak. So, so there's actually a really useful uh, description of uh, work to draw on from the philosophy of science. They ask like, so what is it to understand something? Like to really understand, to like the real thing, not, not the feeling. And they say, look, Understanding is not just knowing separate facts, it's having all the facts cohere together in a usable way. So when you understand something, you have a model that connects things and makes them coherent, right? That model is usable to generate new explanations and actions, and it's easily communicable. So in this paper, what I was saying was, look, so if you wanna game this, if you wanna fake this, then you wanna fake the feeling of coherence, you wanna fake the feeling of usability and you want to fake the feeling of being able to communicate things easily. How do you do that? Conspiracy theories is one. And then actually in the paper, I, I think bureaucracy is another. I think you you two are far more interested in the conspiracy theories, but mm. I think it's just yeah. the actual of bureaucracy. Bureaucracies are there in those intricate webs they weave in everyone's lives as well. Yeah. But the, the, yeah. the thing that, that those points uh, make me think about is you know the a lot of the people that we look at the gurus they they actually do create these extremely elaborate interlocked uh, series of narratives and theoretical frameworks about how the world works the reasons that they are not uh, or they are disparaged by people and and also you know broader often civilization sweeping narratives about right. how the issue of trans bathroom access will relate to the downfall of Western civilization, right? And um, what it strikes me as, you know, when, for example, Jordan Peterson's uh, devoted fans are kind of saying to people when they criticize him, that you're not understanding him in context and you haven't looked at the lectures where he connects these ideas and gives a more nuanced understanding that they aren't all, you know, it's sometimes presented as that's them being disingenuous, right? They, they'll never be satisfied, which, which may be the case. But I think part of it is more related to the point that you're making, which is they, they are uh, kind of swimming in these dense networks of yeah. symbols and connections and narratives. Right. And it, when people come in and kind of point holes in it, it doesn't really work because they have a whole elaborate network and taking out one part of it, it just feels like that's that's barely making a dent. <laughs> well, I mean, the, the thing that it reminds me of is in when you go into the conspiratorial um, communities, the, the, it's, you so often hear them say, you have to go do the research. Yeah, if you don't get if you don't get this, then go go do the research, right? That's that's like a slogan, and I think you're right, Chris. They really do mean that in the sense that it this thing might seem silly on the surface, but when you've done all of the reading that we have and you've <laughs> accumulated this vast uh, complex infrastructure, um, then then it makes sense. So I have, no, I, I have a, a question though that relates to that, uh, and then I'll shut up. Um, but 
so there's a there is an aspect of that there where that's a reasonable thing to do right you know when when you have genuine expertise in a topic and somebody comes and says well i think this and you say well but have you read you know i have this opinion on immigration but have you read anything about immigration or you know the policies the statistics and uh, and genuine people say you know you need to do the research so a question there for you is uh how, how to distinguish those uh requests yeah i mean the a lot of the work i'm doing is fighting this view that say people in echo chambers people in the alt-right are like unthinking or intellectually lazy or like it's like it seems to me like the opposite they're like hyper intellectual in fact like there are sometimes it's almost about being like too attracted to the pleasures of intellectual power and what i mean is something like like the sometimes what the conspiracy theories okay so when I was an undergraduate, I had an English professor, Richard Marius, and he said something that I've always remembered. And he said, we were reading Thomas Pynchon, which is all about real epiphanies and fake epiphanies in Crying About 49, um, something you definitely read as an undergraduate. And uh, he said, well, he had this lovely Southern accent. He said, well, I've always thought that the pleasure of mystery novels was like the pleasure of religion everything that seems disconnected stands revealed as having some kind of perfect order. Um, and a lot of the times, the pleasures of these networks you're talking about remind me of the kind of like some of the vast fantasy novels I mm. read where like, I'm reading Brandon Sanderson right now. And the thing about Brandon Sanderson is there's all these like cool hints and things. And in the end, like, there is an order, like everything makes sense. And that's so pleasurable, right? Ah. So one thing that I think is going on is if you compare, <laughs> if you compare what it's like to be a real scientist, by the way, um, I just read this marvelous book on the a popular book on the philosophy of science from Michael Strevens called The Knowledge Machine. And one of these things it talks about is, look, you're aiming, what you hope for is total coherence, right? That's that's the long-term goal. But as long as you're getting hit with all this other evidence that doesn't fit, you have to like be on the uncomfortable position of saying like, we don't know yet. No theory we have works perfectly. It would be nicer if we had a theory that fit perfectly, but right, we're still waiting. I, I think that takes a certain, I don't know, something where, where with this stuff, you're like, no, no, we've got it. And the... One of the things that's striking, one of the things I was trying to talk about in this paper is that it seems to me that a lot of these theories are made to be easily applicable. So they constantly give you the sensation of intellectual power and understanding. Because if yeah. you can generate explanations yeah. for anything easily, yeah. right, then you feel like it's not that you're unintellectual, you're getting confirmation of your own intellectual powers. Yes. Mm. Yeah, no, I think that's that's true. And it gels with the what I know about the literature on this. So I'm just uh, one random example is that it's actually people who are who are more open to experience, more intellectually curious, uh, and um, who, who tend to succumb to um, um, conspiracy theories or, or, or various other belief systems. The and so the I think the the fact that they're so elaborate, and and is and and, you know, Byzantine in their complexity is part of the appeal because because it is it is it is like it is like saccharin you know it's a it's it's um it's it's intellectually pleasurable in that sense uh, but at the same but you know I've never really got my head around this apparent contradiction which seems to be that on one hand there's one simple explanation for everything yeah as you said this huge amount of expl explanatory power who did it well it, it's 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 the new world order and the and the and the illuminati or whatever or the jews or god you know depending on <laughs> depending on wh what your theory all is of them. there were all of them um, if you're alex but jones. if you're alex jones yeah so um so on one hand it's from one point of view it's extremely simple because ev everything comes back to the one thing but on the other hand it's also extremely complicated and elaborate but i think the key thing that you said is uh, is that it has huge explanatory power like any yeah. new, any new thing that comes along fits 
is can be explained quite easily. Yeah, that's that's a really interesting observation. Um, I mean, I, I haven't spent as much time as you two looking at the particulars of the current gurus, but my guess would be something like the relationship between a single core idea with a really complex application is something that would both give you pleasure because you could tie it back to the single central idea, but also the sensation of power. Like as long as the idea is complicated, yeah. but within your grasp, then you get to have the feeling of intellectual yeah. power. Yeah, yeah. I, I think it's interesting to compare it to the kind of knowledge that is real, but unsatisfying. Like the kind yeah. of, which is the kind of stuff that I feel like I have, right? In psychology, <laughs> right. right? Which is, it's a mess. You know, we don't, you know, it's a lot, there's a bunch of different expl explanations and theories for various things. None of it fits together very well. You know, it's, 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 it's very unsatisfying. It's a very unsatisfying state of affairs. And I think that's often the case for, for real knowledge. It doesn't, doesn't actually, it, it's, yeah, there's some, there's the ratio of hard work you have to do to satisfaction that you get having the, it is, yeah. The the thing it makes me think about uh, just from you two riffing there is that the, you know, when the, the kind of guru people that we look at, they, I think they do exactly what you're uh, talking about, Ty, where they, they focus on, you know, they expand their explanatory uh, ideas across all these fields that they're not experts in to, and kind of sh to showcase mm. their ability, you know, their, their kind of how, how insightful their worldview is. But the, the opposite of that, and of course there's exceptions, but is that as academics become more specialized and more proficient in a particular area, they tend to become less willing to venture grand opinions about fields that they don't know about. So it's the it's a kind of inverse relationship where uh, and of course, there's there's plenty of, you know, mainstream academics who, who do venture grand opinions. But I, I think in general, there's that knowledge amongst academics that becoming highly proficient in a certain field makes you like this kind of this uber nerd about a topic that you recognize is extremely niche and uh yeah that yeah that there's seems the, the, the opposite the, the yeah the, the opposite well, dynamic I, I think you're right there's the the sort of graduate student in a in a field is generally far more <laughs> <laughs> certain of themselves than than a professor but chris i need to jump in and correct you it's pronounced t please t Wait, I, I, now, I, we oh, you did it again um, because we, we have a long history here, by the way, of of, of getting pronouncing everything wrong. So we've referred to Eric Weinstein and Weinstein. Um, still, approximately like fifty. We still do it fifty percent of the way. That's our apologies there. And Matt, I've got his name wrong uh, fairly re re recurrently. <laughs> you called me Matthew Smith. <laughs> yeah. So so you're not alone, but I, I'm you're not alone. very sorry. Um. Yeah. No, I no. So I I've. I think this is super interesting. And one of the, this is this is weird because this connects to another part of my research that is that seems totally unconnected, but I think is weirdly connected, which is like, so if you look at the history of philosophy, so the history of philosophy in the modern era has this fetish for intellectual autonomy, right? For like think it through yourself. Like you can think independently and you can understand everything. One of my, uh, one of my own life-changing experiences was reading this book from a philosopher, Elijah Milgram called The Great Endarkenment. And he has this suggestion that the great enlightenment undermined itself. It said, think for yourself. And that created the sciences and the sciences were, were so vast and so enormous that it is now possible for us to think for ourselves, right? That we have to trust experts and we have to trust experts. So, I mean, expertise is our host. So I was asking my wife about this. She's a chemist and I'm like, so how far away in chemistry do you have to go before things are basically incomprehensible to you? And she was like, I'm an organic chemistry. It's not chemist. It's not just inorganic chemists I can't understand. It's like any sub sub specialty right next door. I have no yeah. fucking clue what's going on. Yeah. So this is, really painful yeah. and i think one of the things that happens with a lot of the figures you're talking about is they actually offer this fantasy of being able to be back in the time when you could understand it all yes mm. 
Yes. And weirdly, that's built into like intellectual, like we, you, if you listen to most philosophers, scientists, like, it's something they're like, it's so important to think for yourself. And then we're sitting here being like, but hold on a second. I don't know the math behind climate change science. Right? Yes. Yeah. Oh, look, I, that is such a, I, I love that observation. I think that is fantastic. I mean, like, it's so true about the absolute need for just out of specialization these days. Like I've, I've published in the journal vaccine, um, human Im, Im, immunotherapeutics and various public health and epidemiological journals, right? I am not, I don't have any hot takes on COVID or how the vaccine, various things going, right? Because my, my, you know, it's that, it's that, the expertise is so narrow these days because it because just because we're covering such a broad range of technologies and and forms of knowledge and the what these people what these gurus offer that's a horribly unsatisfying state of affairs as as you said and the gurus offer this polymath mm. ability to, to to draw it all together uh, which is so satisfying i'm published yeah. in I a mean, philosophy journal <laughs> <laughs> so that's, that's, that's clearly a, an error on someone's part but <laughs> so so one one more thing i want to say i think uh the stuff so at the end of the the seductions of clarity paper i'm trying to figure out what we can do about this and the thing that i end up saying is something like at some point i think a lot of us have this i mean go back to the food analogy I spent a lot of time just like stuffing my face with like the crappiest chips. And at some point you're like, okay, this stuff is not good. Someone has engineered this stuff to be addictive. And you get it, you get it, you get, you evolve this sense of like, no, that's a little too fucking yummy. That's a little too mm. salty and savory and fried. And maybe I can indulge once in a while, but I need to be suspicious because that shit was engineered. And I, I think there's something similar where I think yeah. actual intellectual life when you're exposed to the complexity and difficulty is painful and humiliating. <laughs> it's <laughs> fucking awful. And you almost have to, it's like, it's like learning a taste for kale. You have to, you have to like cultivate <laughs> yourself. This like, that makes you no. morally better. <laughs> <laughs> no, well, it means no, no. you're not fucked. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, no, I, I think that's, I think that's excellent. I'll, I've actually said something similar, which is that, you know, you have to become a little bit suspicious when, when it feels too appealing, when yeah. when it sounds, oh, that sounds right, that's got to be true. And, you know, we all have that feeling a lot of the time in, in this conversation right now, it's a lot of the time some, where someone is saying something, oh, yeah, that sounds completely right. You, We should always be suspicious <laughs> and well, uh, of that feeling, hey. Those are, you know, we see a lot of the gurus and, and it, can, it completely validates your thesis uh, that they when they start engaging and like kind of when we listen to their content and we don't break it down we just you know let it wash over you we often say that it feels really satisfying in the moment and you can kind of you know follow along the connections where they're going uh, jordan peterson is great at it you know kind of giving these extended metaphors and analogies and and layer them on top and connecting them to grand narratives and it feels satisfying in the moment but then when you do when you take time like kind of what we do in the podcast and you you know stop and say okay so what was the argument made here and like what's the evidence for what they're claiming and it 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 very quickly becomes apparent that there's it's a lot of emptiness you know you can spend 15 minutes describing this idea which actually would only take two sentences to explain so there's a, there's a genuine i i think your analogy to kind of junk food that it's it's like super satisfying and we enjoy it in the moment, but afterwards we look at what we've done and uh, are feel really kind of ashamed of ourselves. Really applies. Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, my my take on that, and I sign off on that totally. But another way, um, and another thing, I've thought about that phenomenon, Chris, about how that feeling of it washing over you, and it and it does. It kind of feels right, you know. Like the analogies are evocative. The connections kind of seem you know all right but then when you stop and think about it and, and what we're doing chris is we analyze it like we're adopting an analytic frame of mind where we actually go okay hang on does that follow from that does that actually make or is that a contradiction with this other thing and so on but i think that gurus largely rely on intuitive um, information processing 
that it so it's that and as long as you you know sit back and just let it wash over you that's kind of that um intuitive feeling of it of it feeling right and i, I think i think that um that's so those are ideas from cognitive psychology which i think are helpful here that's not the way they editorialize it though they especially the people we look at tend to invoke you know that they are practicing real science and doing it like in an analytical, scientific rationalist way so but but i think we all know that you know people who claim the mantle of rationalism and science and uh not to be tribalistic tend to often fall into all of those uh all of the traps that they uh claim to avoid so yeah mm -hmm. what well, let me let me give you a let me give you something i want to ask you about something because this is something i've been puzzling over so uh when i wrote um the this thing about echo chambers and how they manipulate trust i have this basic image where um echo chambers are structures where you're told to distrust everyone on the outside. And I kind of said, and you kind of trust everyone on the inside. And I was thinking about like spending a lot of time on the online echo chambers that, I, that I've looked at. By the way, to anyone listening, I, I just have to say, uh, the, I think it's really important to distinguish between filter bubbles and echo chambers. So people have been confusing these two notions. Uh, a filter bubble is when you don't hear the other side and an echo chamber is when you don't trust the other side. Mm -hmm. The original research into echo chambers was about trust structures. And lately people have bundled them all together and all, there are all these disproofs. Like, oh, echo chambers don't exist, but they're all talking about filter bubbles. They're all talking about how you hear people on the other side. Climate change deniers know all the other arguments on the other side. They just distrust them. Anyway, so. Yep, yep. No, it's it, it's a really you've made that point in a bunch of talks, and it's it's a great point because I uh, I think the notion that the point that people aren't hearing the other side is just wrong. It, it's often right. clearly wrong because they spend all day often talking right. about the other side, so obsessively uh, discrediting yeah. the other side. Yeah, yeah. Well, I I want to pick you up on that echo chambers stuff because it really closely ties to one of the key features of our gurus. Um, we we actually described it as anti-establishment but it really is but we, we have another feature where we talk about their their sort of cultish in-group out-group dynamics yeah. but if you actually sort of put those two things together right that for for a lot of gurus the out-group is um everyone else it, it can right. be like a, another political side but a lot of the people we follow are not really they're not political stuff is not their main game there are their their outgroup is the institutions the experts the establishment um yeah. you know um academics like us are definitely in the outgroup mm -hmm. so um and so the establishment is presented by the gurus as being hopelessly corrupted by incentives by groupthink by ideologies etc and therefore you really can't trust them you know you, you and they they spend an awful lot of their time undermining uh all uh, you know all other sources of knowledge while building themselves and sometimes their friends up so that really strikes me as a very now i'll probably get the two terms mixed up echo chambery um thing to do did i get it wrong <laughs> no, you got it right. <laughs> yeah you got it right. there's uh uh man it just went out of my head what i was going to say sorry I, it'll come back <laughs> Let me let me let me finish this thing that I was gonna say because so I think I have this image of echo chambers as ones where everyone on the inside trusted each other hmm. um, and distrusted everyone on the outside world uh, and then Joshua DePaulo, uh, another philosopher, a friend of mine, wrote a critical paper about it where he points out, look, there's another option that also counts as an echo chamber, which is when the leaders make the people inside the echo chamber distrust themselves too, not just the outside world, but also distrust themselves and create this total vacuum that uh, where the only person you trust is the leader. So now it seems to me like there are two echo chamber structures you could have. One is everyone in the echo chamber trusts everyone, everyone else in the echo chamber and each other, but mm. especially the leaders. The other one is Everyone in the echo chamber distrusts everyone on the outside and themselves. They think they've been taught to think that they themselves are dumb. They only trust the leader. So Josh pointed out that that's the second structure is actually characteristic of a lot of older religious cults. And 
I haven't seen that structure a lot in the new online world. I tend to see this like leaders pumping up the confidence uh, of the followers. And I, I'm not sure, and I wanted to ask you because you two follow this stuff better than me. My sense is that it has something to do with the structure of online recruiting, that giving people a sense of pleasure and confidence is a better way to snag people online. And it's harder to, the self-hate, this, I think like the self-hate methodology was the, 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 the methodology that cults use when they could like isolate people and take them out to a compound, right? But yeah. now you need something else. You need like a sugary bait to put on the internet. So my sense is that the, methodo- the, the methodology of cult building has slightly changed um, to this more hedonistic, satisfying, pump up the ego of your audience pe- yeah. thing on the yeah. online world. Yeah, I think... I think you're large. I mean, Chris will have his own thoughts, but I think you're largely right about that, that it is more carrot than stick. There's certainly an awful lot of flattery being done of followers uh, by gurus. Um, on the other hand, you do see some tricks. Um, the one, the thing that we called um, the the emperor's new clothes maneuver, where they where they will say things like, "Now look, I think this is going to be too complicated for a lot of you people to understand, but I respect your intelligence, and I think some of you might be able to get it." And then they proceed to say something quite absurd and outrageous. So nobody wants to be the person that doesn't get it, right? <laughs> so, so, so there's, and there is, um, you know, we do see in our, we, we, we interviewed someone who had spent a fair bit of time in er- Eric Weinstein's Very um, good. <laughs> um, uh, um, Discord, Discord server, the Discord server. And he, he told us a fair bit about some of that uh, follower management that was done, you know, there's a, you know, there was certainly in groups and out groups within, within the, um, the group with, within the discord um, where, you know, the people who were more loyal and more, more on board with the message were definitely uh, treated more favorably than the people who asked irritating questions and challenged things and thought for themselves too much. Hmm. So that's my take. Um, how about you, Chris? Uh, yeah. So I'm in much, I'm echoing probably some of the things that you're saying, but basically I would agree T, that there's, there's a lot of flattery about, you know, you are the guys that can look at these uh, topics with nuance and complexity and like you're, you're interested in scientific approaches, but there's also this element where the, it depends on the guru, but some of them really go along the lines of indulging in almost like Star Trek style techno babble about like specific mathematical or scientific topics where the the way that they are illustrating the concepts feels like it's it's to illustrate their own intelligence yes but the other thing that it's to do is to highlight to the followers that they're they're invited into the club to be a part and to kind of watch and that uh, me and maybe they'll get to that level but there's such a vast difference between where you are and where the guru is that it it if you are going to chastise them for not knowing things you really better do your homework and in their internal communities like the discords and the you know the patreon groups and these kind of things i think there is a greater chance for the old style dynamics, kind of the things Matt is talking about with community management, um, threatening to withdraw access or or nagging people, right? So I think both dynamics are probably at play, but it just depends what uh, right. what part of the network you're looking at or how deep you're into the, uh, the guru's in-group. Right. Now, this makes me think something. So, so there's this paper draft. I haven't even sent it to you, um, but... It's about different kinds of epistemic traps. And I start, one of them I wanna call like a deference trap. Like it's like, stop thinking for yourself. Just believe this thing, just believe me. And another one I wanna call an inquiry trap, which is like a belief system that lets you do a lot of intellectual inquiry, but like subtly sends it down the wrong channels and like redirects your trust settings in various ways. And it the inquiry trap works because it gives people the sensation of being intellectually autonomous and gives people like the feeling of power. 
But in order for it to be a trap, it has to end up in the same place. So if you're building something like this, you need to like do, you can't, it's like you want to give people the feeling of intellectual autonomy and power, but you don't want to actually give them real intellectual autonomy or they'll leave and not follow you. So you have mm. to build this weird, I mean, this feels again like a magician's sleight of hand. And, it, yeah. and listening to the two of you talk about this, this push and pull, I mean, I'm really, I need to listen to this stuff because I'm, I'm really interested in seeing, hearing the experiences of people in the current kind of online thing. Uh, the, mm. the the more cultish thing uh, and it does seem like it sounds like the, the thing you're describing sounds like the technique you'd need to fake giving people intellectual autonomy and then subtly not give it to them yeah um, yeah yeah, yeah I mean, we, Matt and me have often commented and it, it works in a whole different a whole array of circumstances but there's a lot of I I'm like I've described it as people act as if words are magic um and what i mean by that is when somebody editorializes that you know i'm not advocating a conspiracy theory or i'm not going to uh, just pat myself on the back and then they do that they proceed like for 30 or 40 minutes to outline a conspiracy theory that's sweeping and makes all these uh, large disparaging claims about you know entire fields the fact that they added in the just the disclaimers works. It really works as people will. If you point out, that, well, that guy was advancing conspiracy theories. People come back and kind of say, "No, did you not hear? They they said that they are not doing that." And they added disclaimers at the end, saying they're not entirely sure. Maybe they got some things wrong. But it, it feels to me that that's not epistemic humility. It's not genuine. It's it's a kind of covering your ass tactic right. uh, that you only spend if you were really epistemically humility uh you know if you had real epistemic humble, humility right. yeah humble that's what i'm looking for you you wouldn't then spend the hour and only the two minutes on disclaimers it would be the inverse structure so yeah mm. it, it, uh, my my take on what you said t was that the perhaps that problem of managing where the independent inquiry goes to the endpoint is not such a big problem in for, for the gurus or the, just in, in or for these communities a lot of the time so if you take something like um the covid conspiracies around you know everyone wants to blame china right <laughs> so so every, they, they they will they will be naturally drawn there like uh, or it, around climate change they naturally just want to deny that it's happening right so i i feel like the uh, the kind of gurus who exploit these things these issues are pandering to a pre-existing prejudice that is widely held and i guess helping helping them along with the very complex intellectual rationalization for their pre for, for what they wanted to believe in the first place uh, does that make sense yeah uh yeah, I mean, it's, I mean, one thing that unites a lot of the a lot of this stuff is all of these tricks and tactics, like the moral outrage porn stuff, the the fake clarity stuff. It's all like dirty tactics you would use if you don't actually care about the truth. So mm. it's all like playing up the symptoms of the truth and then abandon like making maneuvers that don't actually require loving the truth or giving yeah. a crap about the truth yeah. and then like uh um only fronting as much as it's useful um and yeah yeah well um, i mean uh, pe pe people have talked about um trump and for in exactly the same way for ha having a complete disregard so this is what they call bullshitting right yeah. it's not it, it's not it's not caring about the truth and deliberately wanting to deceive people it's just completely having no regard for it whatsoever um so people have described that uh, of trump have described it as a superpower because it gives you suddenly uh, so many more degrees of freedom <laughs> with which to optimize your persuasive tactics. Um, I think, I, I think I mean, is, is that a fair summary of what, of what you were saying or, or, or not? Yeah, a I mean, 
the the analogy that comes to mind is again uh i mean it's i think it's it's easy with the food analogy like it's uh it's easy to make things delicious if you don't care if they're nutritious that's totally easy like it's really really hard if you actually to like to the balance of nutrition and like goodness is tough and requires other sacrifices let me let me actually float a, a weird theory that just came to mind about this like this really interesting balance between trying to give your followers the feeling of freedom and not um from the other side of my brain so uh i don't think we've talked about this yet but the other half of my philosophy life is about understanding games and the philosophy mm. of games yeah um and I find something really like they've started to collide. And I think there's like, there's a really interesting similarity. So for me, one of the things that makes games incredibly pleasurable is they offer a completely clear sense of value and purpose. Like normal life is like full of these incredibly conflicting plural values um, and they're hard to apply. And then a game, you know exactly what you're doing. You know exactly where you stand. All the values like fit into one economic point system and things are clear. It's like this, Relief. In yep. particular, I think one of, and th this relates to some of the conspiracy theory stuff. I think in our actual lives, trying to get things done is very rarely pleasurable because problems are either so vast and overwhelming that like our abilities don't fit, or like so boring at, that we they're like these easy things we have to do over and over again, and we want to shoot ourselves. But games have been like are like engineered environments to make the process of thinking or doing whatever just fit, like your ability just fit. It just, it, it's, it's a world of practical struggle where the struggles are engineered to feel good. Um, I've seen, there's this article that everyone's been sending me about how Q, a game designer says like QAnon is like mm. a game. And this seems like exactly right. Like, it seems like what you're doing is creating this like game-like puzzle experience of I mean, the thing about games is, unlike, say, science, the puzzles are hard, but they're built for people to solve. And I think, like, it, and you can do that because you have a lot of free play in the game to, like, redesign the environment and the abilities. And I, I kind of think that a lot of, if you're out there to build, like, pleasurable, candy, intellectual belief systems, yep. you want to make them hard, but uh -huh. within human capacity. Yep. So the weird connection with something like, and you know what else game designers are really good at? they're really good at giving you the feeling of freedom and yet steering your action mm -hmm. down a pre-channelized path, right? Like game designers are masters of, oh, you feel free, but you're going to end up at this next mm -hmm. cutscene anyway. And I, I just wonder, like, maybe the analogy goes to that next level too. Like mm -hmm. being able to create a choice environment. I mean, this is like nudges stuff. And like, like one of the background thoughts for me is that like games are a lot like, so when I started researching this stuff, everyone was talking about how games are good because they're like fiction or they tell stories or like movies. And I'm like, no, they're more like cities or governments. They like are these choice spaces full of nudges to get people to go in certain ways. And I feel like intellectually, a lot of these conspiracy-ish yeah. theories have the same like, you're free, but yeah. hey, somehow we've constructed it so you end up in this place. Yeah. Well, look, I think one... One angle of it too, though, is just the is the is is the richness and complexity of the space of the of the game or the conspiracy theory. So there's lots and lots of space for people to do their own research and to and to right. come up with with their own little insights and and elaborations and make their own connections. And it's 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 challenging, but not too challenging in the same way that you were talking about with games. Um, and when you were talking, I was reminded of. Um, the, the the work I've done on uh, complementary and alternative medicines. So these this this field of alternative health treatments ranging from you know homeopathy and energy therapies and kinesiology and there there, there, there is just so many. And it has some similar things to what you describe. Like it's it's an extraordinarily rich and interesting um, landscape for an interested person to explore. Um, I, th I think like a conspiracy theory, it taps to some fundamental anxieties and stuff that people have, perhaps even existential ones uh, about health and stuff uh, in, in the case of um, alternative medicines and conspiracy theories often have, a, there's an underlying kind of thing that they tap that's, that's quite different. But 
um, the it's it's very much it feels it's it's like an alternative. So you, so you have scientific medicine, which is which is boring and difficult and technical. It doesn't have any of these satisfying properties. And then you have this sort of alternate version, which which any interested person can quite easily feel like they're making a lot of progress in mastering and, and understanding. And yeah, anyway, I, I just felt like it was an interesting parallel. I, I'm i sure you're used to this, T, but I, because I have some history and interest in games, I always, I really liked your your discussions and your work on, on gamification. But I, I think like uh, many people who have played games, I'm also, you know, inevitably thinking well what about that counter example that doesn't really exactly fit right like i so uh, in a contrarian way i was thinking about minecraft right where the yep. the goals are like part of the appeal is that the the goals are although there is a game there about a survival game the reality is that most people play it in an open-ended way but um so i'd be interested to hear your thought about that as a nitpicky thing but the other thing is that thinking about that made me, uh, when you pointed out about that you're allowed to play, but there are actual hidden constraints. And it seems like you have endless opportunities, but really you don't. And that also fits the Minecraft analogy where you you can do incredible things. You can rebuild, you know, the Star Trek Enterprise if you want uh, for and, and go around all the nacelles. But... But you're still ultimately trapped in voxels, and uh, yeah. So I, I'm. It's I. I really. It's it just. I think the metaphor sits really nicely. But I'd be interested about the point about you know not that there are games that are popular yep. which seem to have rather open-ended uh, reward systems now. I mean, so one thing I can say is the thing that I'm analyzing is constructed systems and you have a clear goal and a clear uh and clear rules to uh, that constrain how you get to that goal and not all things that are called games in our natural language are like that so i think like chess is like that right mm -hmm. um another thing to think is you have to be really careful now now i'm just putting on my philosophy of games hat um <laughs> you have to be really careful to distinguish the software environment from the game and you can play different games with the same software environment so you can play super mario brothers or you can speed run super mario brothers mm. which is a different game with a different goal played on the same software you can play world of warcraft for experience points and gold or you can go to socialize in the environment okay. and then i think you're yeah you're 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 doing something slightly different so so one thing I think is there are some things that people call video games, uh, but really they're more like toys. They're more open-ended. They're like structures for play. And I think a lot of the times, a lot of modern games are made, uh, a, a lot of modern video games are made so you can engage with it, engage with it with this clear goal, or you could just play around in the environment as a toy. And that's like different activities supported by the same thing so i think like you have to be careful it's there. it's almost as if you thought about this topic in great detail. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, but for I, eight years of my life <laughs> but there there is a, a point related to that that you know you've talked about the gamification of twitter or other social networks right uh, kind of right. harvesting likes and retweets and and i think nobody is immune from the the kind of reward dynamics that are in play there but one thing that struck me about that when I was listening to you talk about that, and uh, maybe you, you can explain that a bit after, um, is that when I look at the case of James Lindsay, right, who's a, a super stimulus in the, the guru sphere at the minute, because he's, he's kind of burning brightly, right, as somebody who, whatever you thought of him, he was once seen to be on the... Uh, kind of legitimate side of things to some extent, right? That he he might be obnoxious and whatnot, but he he has some uh, legitimate arguments that he makes and he's taking things seriously. And in recent months, he's kind of famously, since Trump retweeted him, much more leaned into uh, complete right-wing partisanship, retweeting people from Infowars, endorsing voter ballot conspiracies, and and doing things that, you know, if you are a secular, rational, atheist, concerned about science, you don't promote uh, coronavirus 
uh, conspiracies, which he does. So when I've looked at that, one of the things that keeps coming up when people discussing it is, you know, to what extent does he believe the things he's doing? And to what extent right. is he just engaging in like harvesting followers or, you know, playing to a certain audience? And I'd be really interested to hear your view on that. From my perspective, it looks like it's it's a little bit of, you know, column A and column B, the, the academics or oh, like eternal answer that he he is uh, intentionally doing things to garner controversy and to, you know, uh, that pander to an audience. But at the same time, he seems genuinely to have bought into a whole ecosystem of ideas that are not his own, that are about, you know, the great replacement or the great reset and about uh, Soros's influence that that pre predate him and and kind of co-opt his agenda to some extent. That's that's a lot of things, but I'd be really interested to hear your opinion on uh, any of that. Right. Um, I can I can give you some ideas, then you can apply them to Lindsay because I honestly can't stomach following. <laughs> like you, you have more stomach. Like I, I have no. So I have no actual evidence about him himself. More than like. So, 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 so T has okay. already proved himself far more emotionally aware and stable and well, healthy than the I two will of us, Chris. <laughs> that by interviewing him, because the Guru account only follows the people that we uh, cover in the show. So it's only got like nine or 10 people. And basically the reason I see his tweets, like he's blocked me long ago, is mm -hmm. because our our decoding the guru's account it's basically his twitter feed because he tweets so prolifically but uh after your appearance uh you and contrapoints will be the the kind of uh, <laughs> dilute the stream so yeah, uh, that'll be nice at least yeah. but, but sorry to interrupt you there go, go yeah ahead sorry yeah. yeah so um okay so let me step back for a bit and vomit some stuff on gamification and then we can try to think about how it, as it connects to the situation so there's a standard thought out there that something like games are good so gamification is good this is like james mcgonagall like gamification booster says this uh, i think actually if you understand why games work you'll understand why gamification is terrible um and the reason is that games offer you this wonderful value clarity of a simple artificially clear goal but they do so in a secluded environment where you pursue it away from the rest of the world and where the goal is not connected to the rest of the world. When you gamify ordinary activity, to get that pleasure, you have to simplify the goals in real life, right? Like in some sense, it doesn't matter who I kill in like Dota or whatever, right? But what I say on Twitter matters. So my, the worry is that when you gamify an activity like so I worry about like Fitbit and Twitter. When you gamify Twitter, to make that exciting, you have to change what you care about from, you have to change what you care about from like whatever rich and natural goals you have to like just whatever the points measure, right? It's only thrilling to watch the points come up if you care about them. So this is part of this larger um, phenomenon what I'm actually trying to write about right now is this larger phenomenon I'm calling value capture, which is when you have rich and subtle values and you get put in an environment with really simple, often quantified versions of them. And then they drift into you <laughs> and they start to take over. And I mean, things like for academics, like citation rates, right. Or like the status, there's a really interesting kind of like what, the US News and World Report law school rankings do, like it seems like everyone in that system gets value captured and they just start caring about moving up this clear ranking. And there's this, this weird sense in which it seems like, I haven't quite figured out how it works exactly, but it does look like you have this promise of pleasure. If you align your values with whatever this thing, whatever these, this point system is pounding out, then suddenly you get these huge bursts of pleasure. Yeah, And so, I don't. There, this seems reminiscent in a way of what you're talking about about Lindsay. But again, I don't know. Like yeah. I, what uh, I would imagine is that you know suddenly you get this huge burst of points mm. for doing a certain kind of action, right? Mm. And then if you continue that action, you get more points. And I, I mean, I'm not a psychologist. I don't know how incentives change 
belief systems, but I definitely like, I've been on Twitter for a while and I can feel, I can feel the pull. And it, it's, to yeah. me, it feels like sometimes like I'm on Twitter and then some tweets do really well. Like I try some tweets that are really about what I like, like what I care about. And they're like, you know, whatever. Yeah. And yeah. you say some like zippy peppy thing <laughs> and then it explodes. And then you can start feeling your brain reorient yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. around saying things like that. Yeah. And I don't even know. I've, I mean, I try to pull back. Like I, I can recognize it because like background. One of the reasons I write about games and game addiction is that I've lost years of my life to certain games like <laughs> Civilization 2, 3, and 4, which I'm good. never allowed to touch again. <laughs> good games. Good games. Yeah, good games. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I didn't yeah. say that. But they... Right. No, but you, I can't. They're good. I can't touch. But like, I can feel that. And like the way the way games can take over your brain is like you just start looking. I'm a climber, and sometimes when you climb well and you're in climbing mind, you just look around, and the world is suddenly just like, how would I climb that? How would I go up that? <laughs> and I feel like if when the Twitter thing gets its hooks in you, I walk around the world, and I'm like, yeah. would that be a fun tweet? Would that be yeah. a good tweet? Mm. And it's almost like, to, like, it's almost like, I don't even know if I, it's like the thing that I do that's called believing things as they're true is a little bit disengaged, and yeah. the filter I'm looking around the world is not, is that true? But I'll make a good tweet. Yes. Yeah. That no. creeps me out. Yeah. Whenever that happens, I like make myself delete Twitter for a while. Yeah. Because yeah. like I can feel it and it fucks me up. Yeah. Look, I, I'll i jump in now. Uh, first of all, about Twitter. I mean, one thing I noticed is that what's always the worst tweets, the tweets that I'm actually a little bit ashamed of because they're cheap, that yep. always do the best. And and when, you, when I noticed that, it was a good reminder that never to you know never never to pay attention to that particular scoreboard but i mean i think you know if i understand your point correctly you're basically saying that the 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 re rewiring is going on in one's brain and and um you know value system such that there isn't really a dichotomy between between oh are you bona fide about about this stuff or are you just chasing the thing they've they've the brains rewired so that that's kind of those two things have become conflated and uh what when you mention the um the incentivization of academics towards citations and the various metrics they apply to us i mean you guys probably know the same characters that i do there's a couple of famous figures who ended up publishing and i, I know one of them personally publishing like more than 100 papers a year uh and and you know just these crazy citation metrics M most of it is self plagiarized and and just just regurgitating the same thing and i can tell you that in in his mind he he is he has definitely conflated his original goal of of being you know scientifically influential and and you know do, you know uh, in in a genuine way with with those metrics and yeah I mean, this is so, this is, look, I will do more autobiography than you probably expected. But like, at some point I was like super depressed. I was super depressed in philosophy. And the reason was I realized, I mean, it's the exact same thing. I was just looking at ideas and being like, well, that's, is that publishable? Would that get in a good journal? Mm. Right. Is that the kind of thing you get published in this fancy journal? And again, like it's, thinking about me then, it's not like I was saying things that I thought were false in order to advance professionally. It's like something had slipped in my brain and I was just looking at ideas and the criteria in my head for good ideas was the kind of things that would get public. And like, and I, I was like really depressed for a long time because I was writing things I thought were boring. Um, I actually almost quit the profession and then had this moment. I was like, I can't fucking do this anymore. I have to, and, but, what, one of the interesting things is I ended up writing a blog post on this internal like philosophy thing about how I like tried to throw all this stuff out of my head and like write about things I cared about. And I got mm. this flood of emails from people like all private. I, I won't mention the names. So they're all like, oh my God. Yeah. I've forgotten why I got into philosophy. Like, why am I writing about this boring stuff? And I'm like, these are philosophers, right? If anyone's supposed to be fucking <laughs> resistant to this shit, it's the lover. Like, why the fuck are you in philosophy if you don't care about ideas? But somehow like, 
even I mean to be me, even uh, this will sound weird. even the heavy even, 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 even the philosophers, right, who are supposed to be the bastion, like, whatever, are completely <laughs> vulnerable to having their belief criteria shift from institution like institutional metrics and measures. So I mean. I think of myself as fairly intellectually rigorous and careful, and this shit will subvert me in like a second. Yeah. Right. I'm like, I have to, I feel like I have to be constantly vigilant, and I don't know. Like, I feel like mm. this this like, and I, I lately I've been thinking I've been trying to figure out like I don't know how much we should assign responsibility to people for it. Like sometimes I think it's the like when the entire system pervasively hits you with these points. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Like it's so hard not to realign yourself. Yeah, okay. well, my my other field is um is, is addiction and yeah. the um the the sort of so I'm definitely I'm definitely on board with the idea that you cannot necessarily blame the uh, individual's vulnerability um for for that kind of dopamine reward delivery. Um, but Chris, sorry. No, that I was just going to say that you know the points that you are making, T, and that uh. I think we've discussed also, Matt, on the podcast and offline, uh, relate to the fact that there is there's plenty of genuine criticisms to be made about institutions and academia and and incentive structures, which are there's validity to them, and that's part of the reason I find it so annoying when what we called anti-establishmentarianism is like you know a kind of hollow version of that where they don't they don't actually address things like the the citation metrics I, th that's not a big focus it's mentioned but just in passing and the they act as if that uh your critics if you do not agree with them uh in their critique of you know the establishment that you are a defender of the status quo and and the mainstream establishment and and that might be valid on some occasions but it's chucked around so often and in my case i it works to the it usually doesn't bother me that much because when i see people kind of presenting me as something like one of the things i get presented as is an advocate for wokeism and and it's so far from an actual accurate hit on me that it doesn't bother me because it just feels you know like it it kind of they're they're attacking an a, a, an image that doesn't exist but the the other point that you made about you know doing pursuing what you're interested in and that that often is at odds uh, or seems at odds at least intrinsically from institutional metrics and uh and the things that might be social know, like, metrics like twitter yeah oh yes yes yeah. both yeah. but the i you know when i see your what saw your talks the ones that you know uh partly made us interested to interview you it it was clear you had a passion for the topic and, and we're you know talking about it in an academic way but for an interest purpose and that's to me the most gripping things and in my own example i was arguing with people on facebook about the uh, the cambridge analytica stuff and my wife was like why do you invest so much time arguing with you know like five a handful of friends or you know people and like if you were going to do that why don't you write something and like publish it or like th this was her view right like so that, stop wasting your time arguing with people on the internet and i just wrote a medium blog which essentially took my arguments on facebook and and changed them into you know like a, a an article and that ended up like um probably the only thing i've ever done that went viral and you know ended up being like uh to, quite to my horror, recommended by Dominic Cummings, um, the the guy who was uh, claimed to be responsible for you know the in, engineering Brexit, but but saying like that the dynamics I was talking about about Cambridge Analytica were, were right. So I I just and it's not really related to the guru point. It's more that just to echo your your kind of personal uh, story that pursuing the things that are interesting and which you feel you know are important or have insight i think that's really <laughs> important it's not it's not related to conspiracies or anything or that but uh yeah um uh, just just saying 
Follow, follow your dreams, kids. Follow your dreams. Yeah. Follow <laughs> you too can have a podcast. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, um, okay. So this 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 links to a question I wanted to ask, um, which is um, so you know we talked about that that those social media and gamified incentives, and so it sort of raises the question of to what degree um, our gurus are actually you know you think of a guru as sort of leading the flock. But um, to, to what degree are they being driven by their audiences? You know, that, that desire to build an audience and keep an audience. Are they victims? That's, are they, yeah, yeah, that's really interesting. So I realize I haven't thought about the things from the things from that angle at all. Mostly I've been thinking, um, I've mostly been thinking about like, I've been trying to adopt this like, in some sense, super simplistic model just to help me think. And that super simplistic model is like, imagine you were out to manipulate people and get them to believe this system you wanted. Yeah. How would you build a system? Yeah. Um, and from that angle, um, I was thinking about gamification as a useful tool for a manipulator because if the manipulator is trying to bait people into joining the system for pleasure, gamified systems, uh, the gamification of Twitter really, well, basically it gives it offers a lot of pleasure for being in a part of a large unanimous group. Uh, and so it's a good reinforcement mechanism for getting people to be in a group because you know you get a ton of likes if you say something that people in the group agree with. But now you have me thinking this other thing where it's like, where there's another possibility where, right, like the leaders and the followers evolve together mm. and the leader, like you can imagine them both chasing pleasure and the pleasure comes from either the for the followers having a pleasurable system and the leaders like having people uptake and so you might think that like you could kind of wander into one of the guru positions not from being this kind of like i mean i think like steve bannon for example is just like a purely conscious manipulator like yeah. he's making systems to infect people like that's yeah. but like you can imagine other systems where someone just like starts saying things and people start responding and they get stimulus serotonin hacked into like saying more things and, and right and so they co-evolve and yeah. that that seems like i mean does that seem right that's, of some of the gurus that, you're at? yeah i mean that's my opinion i i i, I would definitely describe it as sort of a co-evolving thing for most of them i think there's there's certainly a few of them that that have some strong ideological prior thing that they're looking to convince people of, um, and there's there's some who are politically political partisans. Like that's how they started, like Scott Adams, for instance. But so they already have like a neat audience <laughs> to um, to sort of talk to. But I, I think a lot of them are much more flexible, and that they're kind of bullshitters. It's it's a bit like Trump's policies, you know. They you know it's really they I don't feel like they come to the table with a strong desire to convince people of something but rather they interact with their and co-evolve with their followers yes yes okay Here, analogy let's go back to the the junk food analogy um Frito-Lay company doesn't have to be out to make you unhealthy or control you. They just have to refer, respond to profits. So they don't have to be aggressively trying to game the gap between nutrition mm. and pleasure. Yeah. All they know is if they may do this thing, then they get more money. And so like functionally that creates a gaming of the gap between nutrition and pleasure, but they can just be responding to incentives. Yeah. So you might think that someone is just like, tw oh my God, Twitter allows incredibly fast meme evolution. They just like, say shit and then some of it takes yeah and then because it gives people pleasure and then they get stimulus response they're like i should say shit more like that and so they get so without yep. aggressively gaming the system they're like pushed to become the kind of people that emit pleasurable yep. catchy sticky ideas I, I i totally agree with that framing okay. and and one of the reasons i agree with it so strongly is because what are these features we've identified again and again is is narcissism like like now so so we we're, we're all subject to, to these to, 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 to the pull of of attention and praise right but narcissists are really subject to it right <laughs> like like they're, they're almost victims to it and and you know it's i don't think it's a coincidence that the the large majority 
of the that we cover you know the the narcissism is so strong the self-aggrandizement is so strong and i feel like that makes them particularly vulnerable or particularly incentivized just just like the the company you described because they're just just like they're just 100 if you're 100 focused on maximizing profits these guys are 100 focused on maximizing attention so so someone like like yourselves might look at oh that's a viral tweet but i'm not very proud of it and and put that aside but a narcissist wouldn't be able to do that that is so interesting i mean i this is this is this is this is why talking across field, like, I don't know. Shit, like, <laughs> so this we, is, we this should is pat ourselves on the back for, you know, yeah. being willing to be engaged with difficult ideas. Or... Yeah. It feels so good. Um, yeah. So, uh, but, okay. So there's a standard view. I don't know if I believe it, that like, you know, companies are psychopaths that just mm. aim at profit because that's the only thing they respond to. So you might think that, I mean, exactly what you said, like, the more you only respond to praise, the more you will spend all your energies optimizing your thought patterns to get exactly. praise. Yeah. And the structure of Twitter makes it really good for harvesting praise. Yeah. Um, and, and, like and obviously not just Twitter, but YouTube and stuff like that. All of yeah. the, all yeah, of the all, modern, yeah. All, all of the it. modern, like you have a channel and likes go up and all, I mean, most of the time people, your followers like you. So you get, it's like, it's like, it's almost like if you could create an environment to optimally evolve. Yes. <laughs> the ultimate like emitter of viral ideas. Yep. Yeah, yeah. If, I, if you wanted to, if you wanted to, if you wanted to select for narcissism, yeah, filter <laughs> out all the people who aren't narcissists, and then build the narcissism <laughs> amongst those people, then we have that now. It's yeah. awful. <laughs> With I, I, I think I have a, a related question, T, and I, I want to get the before. I know your time will be running out, but I, uh, the, so th these ideas, like your talks. Uh, I, I really like them. Obviously, Matt really likes them. And I know that a lot of people uh, that have been exposed to them, especially on the left of center, tend to, uh, or the far left of center, you know, the left wing general, tend to find them uh, appealing, right? Because it it hits a lot of buttons. For one, it's kind of criticizing social networks for the, the incentives that they're, they're damaging society and our brains. And two, that it points out a lot of the features within right wing, uh, like conspiracy communities or right wing gurus or or even you know the the like IDW cent so called centrists, um, that the dynamics that are at play there. But one thing I I wanted to put to you and and get your uh, uh, input on is you know me and Matt are just as guilty of this that you know most of our examples are taken from the right side of the spectrum and I, I don't think there's an equivalence here i think there's an issue about you know that you're you're sampling from a biased pool because there's a there's a bigger amount of it on the right but i want to ask how do you recommend or do you have any suggestions about how people avoid essentially taking the points that you're making and viewing them as these are things which my opponents and the right wing do but which right. us on the left are, you know, are generally immune to or less prone to acting on. And like, do you think that's true? Is right. is there an imbalance, or um, is it just, you know, our our self serving biases right. in play? Right. I I mean, so obviously, I'm fairly left, <laughs> and I think there are echo chambers and moral outrage porn and seductive clarity on both sides. I think it's quite asymmetric. Um, but of course the other side will say, oh no, you all, all whatever. Um, the, the, uh, but I don't think it's totally asymmetric. And I think there are a lot of super, I mean, when I write this stuff, I always am hoping to write it so that the experience of someone reading is but like, I see it on the other side, but wait, what about me? And yeah. I always try to catch, put little like hooks in the end. Cause I think it's easy to get someone to upload it and then 
like turn. Yeah. Um, but I think like the the thing that I'm talking about is uh, I. Th- I have become really cautious of versions that look like this on the left. And I think I see a decent number. And again, it has that feel. Here's a really nice theory that explains everything. And it makes the other side totally evil. And that, hmm. um, but you also have to be like, I mean, one of the dangers here is, I mean, some of the stuff I think starts to look like versions of a conspiracy theory. And one thing that you always have to remember, this is like, I think, Here's a way in which I'm I'm kind of opposed to a lot of other people that think about conspiracy theories in the academy. A lot of people want to say that they all conspiracy theories are bad. What I want to say is, no, no. There are conspiracy theories are sometimes good and they are good when there's actually a real conspiracy. You know, here's a situation in which you should believe in a conspiracy and believe that the mainstream media is corrupted. If you're in Nazi Germany and you're looking around, you're being like, there's a conspiracy that's sweeping the world and it's corrupted media. You're actually right. So yeah. 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 one of the things that we have to be careful about is it, it, you, can't, you can't just say, look, no conspiracy theories, right? And I think, so the thing is like a lot of the people on the, on the left, their beliefs about the functioning of capitalism look a lot like a conspiracy theory and now we have to do the hard work of not saying like well dismiss all conspiracy theories we actually have to figure out which ones which bits are legitimate which ones are legitimate and which are not yeah um so i just got a message and i have to go take care of a child now <laughs> I'm, I'm familiar with that I, I was just about to, to uh, call and enter this fantastic discussion. So um, do you, if you don't have to leap out of your seat immediately for 10 seconds to wrap it up, um, just want to say thanks very much for coming on. We will post uh, links to those excellent lectures um, you've given that are available on YouTube and also a link to your interview on Embrace the Void. Um, and so some good stuff there. And if there's any other cool things you want to share uh, with our audience, we can um, probably find a space for it too. Yeah, thanks so much. Uh, thanks could, so much, I this is awesome. continue on <laughs> endlessly, uh, so we, sorry. Maybe we should sometime, that would be awesome. <laughs> that would be <laughs> <Yeah>. great. <laughs> Excellent, T. Thanks, mate, see ya. Bye-bye. Okay, you can, you can go. Okay. Uh, so one thing that struck me when you were talking about that T and it's an issue that we come up with is that some of the gurus we look at like uh the Weinsteins are always front and center of my mind because they're uh, they're kind of excellent at this but like Eric Weinstein talks about responsible conspiracy theorizing and Brett Weinstein talks about conspiracy hypothesizing not theorizing yeah. it's just a hypothesis and both of them make the point that that you just did where they indicate that there are you know there was watergate there are the dirty tricks of the cia and uh attempted blackmails and there are conspiracies in the in the real world so i uh, one thing i'm i'm curious to get your opinion uh your feedback or opinion on is how do we avoid that we basically say you know on the right, they have conspiracies about the postmodern neo-Marxists overtaking academia. And that's that's obvious nonsense. But the left has things that look similar about yeah. uh, capitalism or institutionalized racism, yeah. racism yeah. Can, could be presented that way as well. And how do we avoid it just being that we say, well, the, the conspiracy theories on the right are obviously crazy, but the ones on the left, well, they're in the category of, you know, reasonable ones. Right. I mean, I, I'll, I'll do you one better. So let me give you something that I think looks, has the shape of a conspiracy theory that I probably believe, that I think it's pretty good evidence for. So if you read uh, the book uh, Dark Money, this is a journalist, um, journalistic investigation of the Koch brothers and how they've been spending money to influence politics for the last you know, like 20 years. And it looks like, so they, they've been funding various libertarian think tanks. They're, they're funding, uh, you know, they're, they're funding scientific ventures that uh, support 
the progress of big oil, stuff like that. Mm. And it, it's a story about a long-term informational manipulation for a purpose by a particular elite cabal, this time the Koch <laughs> brothers. So <laughs> I've read this thing. I've checked it up. Seems reasonable to me. Mm. I have high credence in it. And it's very explanatory of a lot of weird features that you see. So, I mean, here, here's the difficult line to walk. I mean, when I talk about this, like, clarity is seductive thing, people always say, and I, th I mean, I think it's a good thing to say, oh, well, that was very clear. Like, that made every sense of everything. <laughs> so should I be suspicious of it? And maybe the right answer is yes, be suspicious. But, I mean, but here's, ah, here's what I say. It would be too easy if all conspiracy theories were false, right? That rule is too, those stupid people, they believe in conspiracy theories. That's too easy, right? That is exactly the earmarks of the thing we're worried about because we know for a fact that some conspiracy theories are true, right? Mm. So now we get into a much more complicated space. First of all, we know that some conspiracy theories are true. Second of all, remember, I have this worry about clarity being seductive by imitating the joys of understanding. Mm. But the other thing is real understanding also makes things coherent and is joyful. I mean, you, you're a scientist. Like, like when, you, yeah. when you see a theory that, like, the thing is, it, it's not like we should be suspicious of unifying coherent experiences that feel pleasurable. It's that there's a cartoon manipulative version that's imitating closely a real thing, which is, oh my God, some theories do make sense of the world and that feels good. And so now we're in this incredibly difficult space where we have to carefully separate real conspiracy theories from fake ones and genuinely pleasurable unifying experiences with cartoon ones with the pleasure slightly amped up. And that is incredibly hard. Mm. Sometimes I worry that for many of us, whether we like, we don't quite have enough information to do it. That's like my paranoid worry mm. that, that sometimes, um, it's almost sometimes I worry it's just a matter of luck about which institutions you ended up connected with but, but but I mean it's it's super hard and I'm not again I'm not quite sure how to do it the signals again one of the things we talked about before is there is the signal like that certain things are just a little too easy that they've just mm -hmm. been made for pleasure but I'm almost worried that a sufficiently clever group could fake that by making it <laughs> fairly difficult but not too difficult. Like, again, you talk about the labyrinthiness of QAnon, right? Yeah. So, uh, I, like, mm. yeah. it's hard. Uh, look, um, can I, um, I like, I, I'm going to be a bit of a philosopher here and define terms a little bit because <laughs> in, in, in psychology, we, we like to focus on conspiratorial ideation right. rather than conspiracy theories. Yeah. So if conspiracy right. theories are the content, then the ideation is the is the is the sort of um, the, right, the right. mental processes. So the problem with conspiracy theories, as we've talked about, is that there's heap it's there there's heaps of them around and they're completely true, right? There's like every time because the the way that they're defined is any any group of of powerful actors uh, acting secretly um, yeah. in their in their own interests and maybe not in everyone else's best interest, right? So yeah. that is mundane. Yeah, <laughs> that, that, that yeah. happens. That happens all the time, everywhere. So it's it's far too broad a thing. So really, when we talk about conspiracy theories, it's, we're really using a bit lazy language here. Really, what we're talking about is conspiratorial ideation, which I quite, which which we define specifically to be um, making, um, I guess, unwarranted, having right. unwarranted, paranoid, um, and overly elaborate kind of. Um, right. models of this um, so I, I think that's just I think that's just a helpful way and, and I think you can focus on because it's almost like it's almost like the opposite of good science isn't it right. like conspiratorial ideation it's if you think all the things like Occam's Raymond and, and um, evidence base uh, you know working from an evidence base and so on um, the conspiratorial ideation is is almost doing the opposite having a, a large intricate kind of theory with lots of tenuous connections, maybe some some internal contradictions, which a theory shouldn't have, um, and, and being um, I, I've basically motivated by, by these um, prejudices or biases. Um, anyway, so that, that's... It, yeah, I mean, it sounds like both of you are hitting the point, you know, it's not a conspiracy when they're out to get you. Um, but the, the, 
I think the point you made T about you know the that there's versions of conspiracies which are which are accurate and and like for example the flip side for the uh, cock funding is people focusing on George Soros right and and now again I'm not saying there's an exact equivalence to draw here yeah. but there's there's a version of it where yes there is there are funders who support specific kind of causes and you know some can be more nefarious than others but they are funding things and often they're doing it fairly openly you know so the question is like when it's hidden and through shell companies and all that kind of thing right. but i i think your point about that it's hard to thread the needle is really important because like take for example the uh the current issue about the origins of the coronavirus right now this is a topic that's super popular amongst the gurus we look at to highlight their heterodox thing that that they're willing to consider the possibility that it's you know a lab leak, but they don't they don't just consider it a possibility. Like some of them set the possibility at over ninety percent. But what I find is they frame it as if nobody's allowed to talk about that hypothesis, and it it's not even on the cards. It's it's verboten, right? But when you actually listen to experts discuss it they they do leave space for that possibility but what they do is that they put it in with the probabilities and they say we can't rule this out completely but it's very unlikely from the current amount of evidence and and they give the reasons right and go through it but getting to that nuanced place where you're saying that what the other person is doing is conspiracy theorizing even though there is still a possibility that it's true right that it's the it's the the reasoning approach which is kind of going wrong which is you know what echoing what matt said rather than the outcome which which could be that you know if, if we say there was some massive chinese government uh cover-up and all of the virus virologist community had kind of not anticipated the level of duplicity that was involved and they find out oh yes it, the it did go through you know um processing in a lab it it wouldn't mean that their reasoning was wrong it would it would just be that there was a, a grand conspiracy which was extremely unlikely and yeah yeah it, so it, it seems difficult i'm worried so thinking about this and thinking about the ideation thing i'm a little worried that the psychological approach that matt is talking about makes things a little too easy and helps itself to a certain thing which is i mean so, I mean, think about something like paranoid. So what it is to, so you, can, could I use this in self-reflection? Could I be like, look, am I doing the real thing or am I involved in ideation? Well, it depends if I'm paranoid. But again, the problem is a belief in a conspiracy theory is paranoid if it's false. But if you believe it, you believe it's true, right? Yeah. Similarly, like if you did the reasoning, then you're not going to think, that you're unwarranted. So, mm -hmm. I, but, but I think like in the background, I think there's a slightly different picture about what's happening with, with conspiracy theories and a lot of it. So my worry is that some of the psychological kind of, uh, of uh, conspiratorial ideation may be right of some people, but I'm worried that that's sometimes too individualistic an account that is mostly focused on trying to find a reasoning error in a person and my worry is mm. again if you set if someone sets the evidence mm. in the right way and sets i mean remember the big background picture here is that we learned how who to trust from other people right yeah. so if you start and you very everyone has to trust their parents and teachers about parts of the world. So if your parents and teachers tell you most of these things are false, it's only Fox News or whatever that tells you the truth. And that's a reasonable first, and believing mm. the teachers around you yeah. is a reasonable first move. Then now your trusted source of evidence is giving you the, the sets of evidence. So like, so I'm told, so a lot yeah. of the times my worry is that it's not an ideation problem. It's like a large scale sustaining yeah. misinformation yeah. problem. Yeah. Look, and yeah. if you make it pleasurable, then people, it's simultaneously a little extra sticky, Yep. right? Yeah. So my worry is that what we should be looking for is 
reasonable procedures in tainted informational environments, which is mm. a different story from a purely psychological process yeah. of jumping. And I think that, that story might be true of some people. Yeah. Right. Oh, look, look, yeah, no, I completely agree with that. And in that, in that sort of that, that, that psychological framing I gave it, I don't want to overemphasize, you know, the, the bias, you know, the biases and fallacies or the, or the, or the um, emotional motivations of the people. Those are, those are useful explanatory factors, but I, but I definitely agree with you that they're not a necessary component at all, but I, I probably would stick to my guns slightly in, in describing the sort of the process of, of the, the way in which they're evaluated as, as, be, as enacting bad like yeah, like a bad scientific investigation <laughs> principles okay. i suppose okay. um however this connects back to what you mentioned earlier on which again i i, I wanted to um i wanted to follow up on because I, I really think it's important how important a trust having a good trust network is and, and and that we all necessarily rely on authoritative sources of information um like my opinions about climate change do not derive from a close inspection of the of the raw data there is far far too much of it um we, we talked about special talked about specialization and so on so i just want i suppose i'm just simply agreeing with you that in, in practical terms how, how in terms of how us as or just people as, as just in, consumers of information and have a, a havers of opinions should be doing is probably the most important thing is is figuring out the, the the correct trust allocations to have and a lot of the people who are victims of conspiracy theories or uh, um, uh, adhere to them are not there's nothing wrong with them psychologically that I, I, just as you said they've, they've simply often through no fault of their own allocated the trust to the wrong sources yeah and I mean, I'm, I'm really, sometimes I just really like, sometimes I can tell a story that says like, no, it's that procedure is totally reasonable. Another time, other times I think like, what it often seems like is once you accept the belief system, it's self-sustaining and it, but what about the moment of acceptance? And sometimes I think like what you might find is not like wild irrationality, but like what, like a moment of weakness where you're like, oh yeah, that's nice to believe that person. And then once you start doing that, rational procedures are self-sustaining to continue that belief. Yeah, yeah. So it's just like, it's just like a little slip. And I think that's, and I like, I don't, I don't even know how to assign responsibilities. Mm. Right. Um, this, and I don't, I mean, I, there's also all this other stuff where I worry that like, if you have these situations where you reason a little bit more loosely and just a little bit and you get enormous amounts of emotional comfort like that's mm. really hard to resist yeah Does yeah it... no I, I i agree sorry i'll be really quick here no go ahead, but no, I, go ahead. Just, just my gut feeling on this is and this is just pure opinion now not not being all professorial and stuff it's just that i my gut feeling is that the two two things that help with that is is being is trying to be dispassionate like just 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 cultivating that a little bit and, and um that helps i think um yeah. and being willing to revisit one's one's assumptions you know th th those two little you know um good habits um can maybe help us um pull back from the brink after we've sort of accepted that first premise and then and then have started going down a rabbit hole and i think we all have i think everyone has gone down some little rabbit hole at some point in their lives and you need to be able to walk it back and i feel like those two things can help here's a worry i'm 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 going to continue to play the pessimist about rationality here i'm not totally sure about this but here's my worry a lot of the times the systems that are so sticky and catchy get some of their catchiness by simulating the a particular experience of rethinking your assumptions and that looks like oh what your assumption was was cnn is trustworthy yeah. rethink that and that's why i mean right so that's why in some ways like and i think the party line in a lot of these worlds is like oh you sheep you haven't even re you just trust mm. cnn we've thought about it we've stepped back we've yeah. worried yeah. yeah and that i mean so i don't think you say like oh you're never rethinking your assumptions 
right? Yeah. No, 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 I, I, and that's I, the I, I, get, I agree. There is no magic bullet that, that, yeah. that solves that problem. It's like a, it's, it, you, you can't, it's very hard to reason your way out of a place of delusion, I think. But um, I think, you know, the, like that point about that, having skepticism and cynicism to, to like, and it being rewarding. Like I think about the, I, I was strongly interested in Buddhism when I was a teenager in the, in the kind of, you know, slightly exotic, uh, like, oh, it's a philosophy, not a religion kind of way. And then I went to university and started studying actual uh, Buddhist history and cultures and find out, oh dear, like my, my illusion was shattered. But, and I, that was unpleasant, right? But then there's a pleasure that comes from it where you're like, oh, actually now I get to find out the reality and it's complex and it's messy and the history is actually interesting but there's a pleasure in that oh i i saw through the facade and yeah. you, when i see people talking exactly like you said to you about cnn or the who or institutions there's there's the same feeling that they've seen through things that that others haven't and i don't it's hard to it's really hard to explain that well you're yes i get the pleasure and i also get that you're right you're right to be cynical but you've took it too too far <laughs> and I, like yeah and that that feels like it's a position that the it's hard to communicate in a way that doesn't end up sounding like special pleading but it's it's probably exactly what you said at the start of this conversation about you know the reality is complex, unsatisfying, sometimes a bit contradictory, and and that's but that's what you have to deal with if you want to grapple with reality. I I was actually thinking about this on a walk earlier today, and I this went in a weird place. So we'll uh, let me see what you think about this. So one thing, sometimes I think like, okay, is there is there an internal hint that I've that I'm caught in something like this, right? And one thought you might have is, you know, I said before, like, one of the pleasures of a game is that it's made to fit your mind and it feels like terrible to do the stuff in the game. And the worry I had was like, it's almost like, look, if you think you have a total picture of the world, like, how could you think that the world is something that would just fit easily in your mind? Right. Mm -hmm. So maybe a little sign is that it's too easy, right? That you think you have a final answer. Yeah. Um, yeah. Mm. But then again, once again, the worry is, but what does it feel like when, like, what does it feel like to be Darwin? Oh my God. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I, I understand so much now. But yeah, yeah but, there was yeah, but, a real Galileo. Even though yeah, there's a lot no. of people thinking they are Galileo, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, I still think it's a good rule of thumb. I, I quite like that. That when, when it when it when it seems to when it seems to fit um it, it like a like a hand in a glove and it just yeah. seems to the mist seems to fall from your eyes and everything now makes sense. That's that should make you very very suspicious <laughs> and cautious. Yeah, yeah. Um, cool. So is there anything else we wanted to, um, points we needed to cover before we, um, um wrap this up? Anything I that think... you feel we've badly misrepresented? <laughs> but, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> this is awesome. This has been an incredible time. If you, uh, if we spend some time and you see more phenomena and I've been thinking about this more, I'd love to talk again and figure out more stuff. It's, I, I do think that like, the philosopher's way of thinking and the psychologist's way of thinking, the anthropologist's way of thinking are are usefully different intersecting things. Yeah. Yeah, totally yeah, this totally is, agree. Mm. This is this has been really <laughs> like, you know, I, I feel after we just did the Douglas Murray episode where Douglas Murray and Eric Weinstein slap themselves on the back for four hours. <laughs> I thought, I'm in danger of falling into yeah, that yeah, area. Yeah, yeah. But yeah. I will say for me, just for me, the the this has been extremely enjoyable conversation and T I, I really genuinely love the work you're doing. So yeah, keep, keep it up. And, 
I'm sure our paths will cross again before too long. Absolutely. I think I think there's going to, there's there's so many intersections between the stuff we're doing with the gurus and the stuff you're investigating in your academic work. And, and as we said offline, we are hoping, planning to to eventually write something um, academicy on this ourselves. And um, yeah, it'll be it'll be great to be um, you know working in the same field. So yeah, thanks again for coming on, T. Thanks so much. Bye.